Hello, it's Chaplin73 here. Thank you for joining me for another interview. Um, I am joined today by Nathan Kickbush, um, all the way across the water um, in Canada. Hello, Nathan. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing um, good. I will, I'll just crack on with the questions then, Nathan. Um, the first question, obviously, no, is an opportunity for you to tell us who you are, what you do, and where you're based, so that everyone's got some idea of who we're talking to today. Sounds good. Uh, I'm Nathan. Uh, most people know me by Kickbush or Wild Bill. <laughs> um, Wild Bill because I live in the middle of the bush. I'm in central BC. I, mm -hmm. I live 600 kilometers up a logging road <laughs> uh, in a small First Nation community and, uh, and I love it. <laughs> I live off grid and uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. I live in a dream spot. <laughs> And what is it you do? Um, I do just about anything, uh, but I focus on uh, digital work, um, you know, uh, drawing, pen and ink, uh, uh, painting, oil, acrylic, spray paint. Um, I've pretty much done it all. I stay away from the the physical sculpture and and stuff like that. I, I just eh, it doesn't. <laughs> but as far as anything, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to crafting uh, images and stuff like that, I, I just comes out of nowhere. I do, I do. And um, so, how has where you live, your location, how has that impacted on the way that you create on or, or what you create? Even? Um. Well. It, it, when I first went to art school, I was in, on Vancouver Island, and Vancouver Island's really well known for uh, a plethora of artists, uh, all different kinds of artists, uh, folk artists, uh, a lot of different uh, styles of work, and really vibrant community. And and then I moved up north with my wife, and you know I knew consciously that I could uh, do my work anywhere because. Mm -hmm all I really need is, is uh, access to materials and stuff like that. And now with the way things are, you can order just about anything you need. Uh, so, and with, you know, Wi-Fi and uh, satellite connection, I, I can communicate like I am right now with anybody I need to. And, uh, you know, we, we can, I can still do my work here. It, it just as easy as I, I could on the island. The only limitations I think I really run into um, is the lack of studio space um mm -hmm. i'm in a you know our cabin's fairly small so you know we're in you know like our living space is our studio space right now like our living room yeah i got my drawing table set up right right inside the living room and my wife's got her area all set up and you know that's one of the big limitations when we first got up here we didn't have very good accommodation so um, a lot of materials, uh, the things that I learned, like uh, acrylic paint can't be frozen. <laughs> Didn't know that. Uh, I live in minus 50 temperature uh, during the winter for a good portion of the winter. And I had all my acrylics, golden paints, all, you know, like I had a huge collection, probably a thousand dollars worth of paint, uh, just go by the wayside because I stored it outside. I didn't realize that the shed was a bad place for my acrylic paints, uh, only to find out later that, yeah, this is a bad idea. So, you know, of course now I've made an adjustment. So I'm going back to uh, oils, you know, because they're just more suitable for this, this uh, place I'm in. Um, yeah. That said, it's a learning curve, right? You just have to learn, uh, figure things out and do what you got to do. So, for me like i want to start painting right away i just moved into our cabin now we're off grid we have no water no power so basically i need to create a studio space some space that i can work and the best thing i can come up with right now for me for the summer is throwing a tarp up and creating a space that's you know covered <laughs> you know and that'll be it and that's where i'm gonna paint this this summer so you know you just, I think as an artist, you just got to be creative in how you do what you do and push, you know, and just don't let the little things get in your way. You know, oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. You know, you, you just got to 
you say, no, I'm going to be creative today. I'm going to do something that's, that's getting me going. So one of the big adjustments uh, to get me going was to get back onto a computer. Like I lost my computer when I first came up because we were on generator power. I didn't know SS, uh, the new memory cards, they don't like to be shut down without proper shutdown. Nice. And so I lost my computer really badly and it just basically didn't like the new move. I had a really high end computer with it all opened up and there was tons of dust. It just, it just conked out on me. And so then I, I had no real way of doing any art. All my stuff was in boxes and bins and I, I didn't, I didn't want to pull it out because the accommodation was bad. There was mold and things like that. So I just was like, keep it safe, keep it stored. And so I went like that for eight years. It started getting frustrating, but at a certain point you just say, you know what, I will get creative again. And, and I went and bought a new laptop. As soon as I got the laptop, I put my Adobe back on. And so then I have Adobe again. So now at least I can work on some digital stuff, you know, be creative without having to, you know, pull all my material out, get it all set up, have a play, you know, like, I'm very meticulous with my materials. I, I, want, I want it all set out so I can see it. And I know what I can, if I have an idea, I want to be able to pull out my pens if it's a pen project. I want to be able to pull out my airbrush if it's an airbrush project. I want to be able to spray paint if I'm going to spray paint it, if it's a spray paint project. All of these things have conditions. Like you can't paint oil paints inside in your home. You can't, period. It is not safe. It's not good for you. Um, it smells awful, <laughs> you know, so, you know, there's things that you just got to be conscious of and think about it and then like, go, okay, well, what am I going to do to make this work? You know, and if you don't have material, you know, start looking around, you know, the, there's material everywhere. You know, if it comes down to it, I, I know how it is. Like when you don't have access to certain things and let's be honest, art materials are expensive. Just start being creative with the things around you and that'll get the juices flowing. And once you start moving forward, if you make a little bit of money in art, my suggestion is you spend all of that money back into art for yourself. So yeah. buy materials and start stockpiling it and, and don't use it right away. Just get like an art store's worth already and it's just there. Then when you start getting going, you can just go and just do what you want to do. But if, if you don't have that going when you are ready to go, you're kind of out, you know, it just, yeah. it becomes a frustration and uh, it can really eat at you as an artist and you need to step back. You know, lots of people forget that artists need life experience too. Yeah. yeah that, oh, how'd you come up with that idea? How, where does this stuff come from? You know, that, there was two types of people at our school. Ones that wanted to learn how to be an artist and the ones that were artists who wanted to learn how to further themselves as artists. Yeah. You know, they knew, they knew that they were artists. They just didn't know how to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. Like me, I, I, when I went back to art school, I knew I was an artist. I didn't need the, the diploma. I didn't need the piece of paper. I, I took whatever courses I wanted. I didn't stick with the program, you know, and they didn't like it, but I got straight A's, <laughs> you know, and in the end they were like, leave because you're, you're causing problems for everybody else. You should be teaching, not, not sitting in class. Like, and so I left with confidence that I was back in my game. Right. But it took 20 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are people who, who need to create rather than want to create. Um, and yeah, you, you touched on something earlier about the technology and, and the fact that obviously we're speaking now through technology. Um, is there a community, a creative community where you live or is it? Just um, yourself, or? Within the within the First Nation community that I live, we're a small community. We only have 500 people here mm -hmm. and we're 600 kilometers away from the nearest city. And that's on forest logging roads. Mm -hmm. So dirt gravel roads that have huge logging trucks going up and down them. So the members that I live with in the community I live with are amazing people. They have limited access to anything to do mm -hmm. cr creative work. 
So you're touching on one of the things that's a future project for me is that I want to build a studio space for the members in the community where they have access to materials and supplies and you know a small space a corner where they can call theirs they can go sit for the day and be creative have somewhere to put their work where it isn't going to get wrecked and and basically you know have it as a, a no you know and I think that's something that's lacking in our community. I think mm -hmm. that most members have something to say, which is something that most people who want to be artists don't understand. You know, like they don't understand that it comes from inside you. You have to have something mm, that you need to say. It, 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 it doesn't just come from anywhere. That's why abstractism is such a thing right now is because in school, it's easy to teach. It's, it's like, the, the most common denominator out there. It's it's really just a, a tool. Abstractism is a tool. If you don't have experience as an artist, it really just comes out clumsy. It looks like garbage, to be honest. To me, I just I look at a lot of work that gets sold, and it's it you know contemporary work right now. It has little to nothing in it, and it, that's the product of our schools and the teaching. You know, not the artists. They've been conned into the paint is worth something. It's not. It's not yeah. even worth it. You know, in, in these cheap Chinese canvases, they're worth nothing. The local corner store, art store, and and think you're going to have a masterpiece. It it is it it comes from within, right? And you need to make sure that everything you do is, is, you know, online with that, you know, like you can't make a, a quality piece with sub quality materials and, and be conscious of what you're, you're trying to do. You know, if you're trying to just do a quick one off, you know, whatever, so, so be it, you know, but you know, these swooshes across the canvas and stuff like that, it, those days are over, man. Like, I, I think that's where street art is, right? Um, you know, they're, they're showing that people can do really fast work, but still have it look stunning, yeah, like yeah. stunning, you, you know? And they're using materials that would be considered cheap, right? But they're making it work. And that's what's so important, you know, is that even though it may seem uh, really complex and everything, it's base materials, tools and stuff like that. You know, and I, I think that a lot of people forget this when they're, they're working, you know, and the technology and, and all that, it, it, can, it, it can sell your work, but it can also downgrade your work too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, um, definitely. Um, you say you do a broad range of art, but can you tell us who or what has influenced the style of the art that you create? Um, my main influence would probably be one of my close and dear friends. Um, he took me in I, when I was young, I didn't have a lot of, I was told I had a disability and, uh, I ended up on a street when I was young. Um, this guy ghost took me in and, uh, he taught me everything I knew, uh, know about spray painting, about doing street art. Uh, he basically was a savant. He, he, he was a crazy guy, hands fear. He, uh, he taught me about uh, uh, writing, uh, calligraphy styles. Um, he taught me about what it was all about, you know, and sadly, <laughs> when he was off his meds one time, uh, he's schizophrenic. He had an episode and was killed by police um, right in the streets, right downtown and uh, had to watch it happen. So, you know, if I were to, to think about uh, somebody who really influenced me, it would be him. You know, he took me in, he, he showed me the work, the, the how to, to be a street artist, you know, and uh, he taught me how to, to be an artist without 
without anything, you know. Mm -hmm. I had nothing. I was on the street. So, you know, we figured out ways of getting cans. That, that was the big deal. So, you know, you got smart. <laughs> you know, you, you figure out how you can get your paint. And, and he, he would look at people and regular people that walk down the street. And then he would paint like elf characters and stuff like that, but of them. Right. So, like, when they come down the next day to go to work, they see their face on the wall. And it's just like, and we would just be sitting there just like, <laughs> wait for their reaction. It was, for him, it was all about the, the initial reaction yeah. of the interaction with the piece right away. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about being famous. Just, he lived for that moment of seeing that person's reaction, knowing that that, that was them on the wall yeah. <laughs> where did that come from you know <laughs> and so he, he he gave me that amazement in art how do you capture that moment in a person when they're just like whoa wait a second you know you got them to stop and look at something for a second yeah that's art oh absolutely right? absolutely um, the three second yeah. rule right yeah you got to get people to look for three seconds or more that's what you got to do if they can talk about it or look at it for more than three seconds, you're you're doing something. Uh, it, it sounds like you were really privileged to have spent that time with him, um, and he sounds like a very special guy. Um, yeah. So, what advice would you give to someone um, wanting to make and sell art in 2021, where we're at now? I would say be willing to compromise. So, like for me. I don't know if you noticed with my work, like I, I'm super heavy detail. I can spend thousands of hours on a drawing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that can get taxing. And, and the thing is, is if you pour that much effort into something and you're waiting for it to sell, it can be discouraging. So one of my biggest things I've learned over the last couple of years, especially through SOV, and, uh, you know, being a, a member of the group, um, of the secret society of super villain artists. Like that's seriously cool thing. Um, even though, you know, I just went to a minor conflict with one of the members and it, 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 it was like, is this really happening? I couldn't even believe it. I was like, I, I've rubbed somebody the wrong way. But one thing I'll say is out of that entire discussion, I ended up with over a thousand new friends adding on my profile. I, I did generate a, a large amount of sales. Um, most of what I did was compromise in the end. I, I, I did stand up for myself though. You know, like I, I did have that moment of, I'm going to say what I need to say, but then I, I did, you know, come back to my spot. And one of the things I did learn was that, you know, sometimes with my work, I've got to be willing to just do something quick, get it out, and uh, reap a little bit of reward for, you know, like the studio idea. So my idea on this is to create some designs, put them on t-shirts and hoodies and merchandise, create a little bit of revenue that comes in steady to help uh, facilitate this studio. And also give a, a, an option for the members to see, hey, Nathan's making a little bit of money off of t-shirts and stuff like hey, this is something we could do you know it, it basically leading by example and showing uh the the members here in the community in a small community that hey you don't need to be in new york you don't need to be in this place or that place you, you can do this from here <laughs> you know and so i i think that's the biggest one is being willing to compromise and allow yourself to come down a few steps for sales you know what i mean but also don't undercut yourself. Don't yeah. do it. It's same thing in landscaping, same thing in the trades. If you sell yourself for a certain price, it's very hard to go up. If you keep yourself at a rate that's fair to you and fair to your materials, you always have to at least make back your materials, period. But if you only make your materials, you're telling yourself that your, worth, your work is worth nothing. Mm -hmm. That it was just the materials that were worth something. Yeah. And that's not fair to you. So remember that. 
make sure that you always hit that baseline and make sure that you always go home with something too, because it's your work and you deserve it. Right. Great advice. Like, it's yeah. just the way it is, you know, and people who want to go cheap and, you know, then they don't really want art. They don't, they're the ones that will turn around and sell it mm -hmm. because, or just, or, or throw it to a, 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 a goodwill bin. Mm -hmm. That's when you find uh, things in thrift stores because they didn't really care. They just they thought it would look nice on their wall for a little while. And now they've got a new idea and it just goes in a bin. Yeah. You want to make sure that if you, that piece is important to you, that they, they that the person buying it feels the importance of what you're buying because otherwise, like I said, it, it could just end up in a bin. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants that. Right. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, the next question I really like asking people, um, which, which is the, the question about um, if you could spend 24 hours with an artist, living or dead, we've got a time machine now, you can go back in time, you can spend it with whoever you want to spend it with. Who would you spend 24 hours with and what would you do for the 24 hours? All right, I've been rolling this one over. This one was, I, this is a tough one, right? Because like, <laughs> You know, all the names go through my head, right? Like Michelangelo, Raphael, like yeah, Durr. Um, all right, well, all right, I'll just list off some of the main artists that really, really get me going. So you got Rembrandt, you got Durr. Durr is a major influence to me. I would probably love to see his studio for 24 hours. Uh, you know, uh, Picasso, Matisse. I'd like to have both them in the room together because I know there's a painting that they worked on together. Mm -hmm. They painted over each other for like 50 times, 60 times on that chair painting. So I'd love to sit and talk to them. Um, but when it really comes right down to it, living, probably Mason, <laughs> you know, just because if I'm going to hang out with somebody, I better hang out with somebody who likes to get down, have fun, party has a little bit of an ego just like me he, i see him as a contemporary peer you know he basically gets art like i do and mm -hmm. uh i don't think there's as many people out there as like me and him um we were few and far between i know there's others out there you know um but i respect him he's an oil painter he knows his work he knows what he's doing and uh he deserves the respect he gets and uh you know uh dead probably gonna lean towards music janice and Jimi hendrix <laughs> if i could sit down in that hotel for 24 hours poolside with jimmy and and janice well, my life well. would be that <laughs> i would be made right there i just you know like just yeah. you know and if mama and the papas showed up <laughs> just randomly I would be Mama Cash, just sit down and there we go, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the living Mason, you know, the the motel where all the, the really great artists ever met, you know, musicians and stuff like that. Music was one of my main influences. Mm -hmm. uh, once I left the streets, I went into raves and was doing uh, sound and throwing raves and stuff like that for almost 20 years. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I found a real love in music. Music really drives me. You know, like when I'm working, I have music going. And yeah, my I, my brother, he was, he was always pushing me musically. He's a, a musician, he's a DJ, amazing artist too. And always just pushed me as a, as an artist too, so. Yep. Yeah, I I, th I think music plays it plays such a huge part in a lot of people's lives. You know, uh, most people's lives. You know, most people can relate to a song and when they first heard it, or what they were going through in their life when they heard a piece of music. So, so it's really important to us. Uh, and and I think the music scene, you know, like you mentioned, the rave scene, the hip hop scene, all of that is very much intertwined with the street culture and graffiti yeah, and yeah, the yeah. art movements that were happening at the time absolutely you know they're, they're all very interwoven um, and yeah you know who wouldn't want to spend the time uh, sat next to a pool with jimmy <laughs> right <laughs> well you know 
I think too, uh, one of the things that really drives me as, a, as an artist is I recognized at a certain point that there were certain musicians, like certain DJs that had full control of the room, mm -hmm. full control. Like the people in that room did not, were not choosing anything at that moment. They were, they were mesmerized and tran entranced by that DJ. And uh, not just because of the music he was playing, but there was just something about the presence of that particular person that particular night. Nobody else in, in the world was going to experience what you were experiencing in that room together mm -hmm. with the rest of those people. And one thing I recognized early, early on with music is that there's something intangible about art like when you sit in front of a painting, what makes a person's like hair stand up on the back of their neck? You know that feeling when you hear a, a, a song that just, whew, <laughs> yeah. it just makes everything all just fuzzy, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, for me as an artist, that's my ultimate goal as a painter, as an as a, a illustrator or drawing, whatever I do. I'm always stri striving for that like forbidden fruit almost in the art world of uh, what is, how do you express feeling in a painting? How do you get that hair on the, the back? Of, whoa, I, I don't know. I need to stand back from this for a minute. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. If I can get even one piece that does that, I, I know I've made it right and <laughs> and that's that's the real trick right um, yeah musicians yeah, seem to be able to do this right and music seems to have this inner way of being that way you know it, it's the classic everybody knows the classic tunes because they they have this uh longevity you know like a classic tune is always going to be a classic tune and it, nobody really can explain why it's it's sort of almost a, a becomes a sublime state of being because it just continues, right? <laughs> like uh, there's kids now that listen to music that were, you know, that are super influential when are my parents were kids, you know, and they don't even realize what generation they're listening to at that point because it's such an iconic song yeah. that they don't realize it was over, you know, 60 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. My, my kids quite often kids. say, yeah, my kids quite often say to me, you know, uh, oh, this is probably around when you were a kid. And I was like, no, this is around when my dad was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, I had, I had a girl I was dating who didn't know who Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix were. Mm. And we were having a music discussion. And she said she knew music. And I'm like... How can you say you know music if you don't know Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin? Like, I, I'm sorry, but... And then I play Janis Joplin for her, and she's like, oh, I know that song. I'm like, so you know Janis Joplin, but you don't know Janis yeah, Joplin. Just like, didn't know uh, it was Janis Joplin. I, I'm like, we can't date. <laughs> that was it. It was just like, we can't date. You're too, you're polar, you're too young. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> The last question, finally, um, what is in store for the future? And is there anything you're currently working on or planning that you could share with us today? Well, I touched on one of the projects. So mm -hmm. my studio uh, t-shirt and, and design stuff, I'm working on that actively, you know, to generate funds for, for the community to do that, which is super exciting for me. I'm trying yeah. to do it uh, in a different way. Uh, no government funding, so there's little obligation. I, I would like the art community in general around the world to help start supporting First Nations and becoming creative like they always were before. Um, mm -hmm. And I think as artists, we all could help bring back the culture of First Nations um, yeah. by supporting. And, and that's what I aim to do and, and and tr gonna try to do with uh, the designs I'm doing. That's, you know, the only reason why I pulled the original design that caused conflict. I, I had no idea it was even going to cause conflict, mm -hmm. um, but it was frustrating for me because it was the launch of what I was about to do. 
you yeah. know what I mean? And I think yeah. that's what rubbed me the, the, the wrong way, right? Was that, hey, like, you're missing the whole point of what I'm trying to do, you know? Like, this, you're getting hung up on one word based, and you're not even letting me get out why I was doing this stuff in the first place. Like, you know, and I think if I'd gotten that point across, it might have went off a lot easier. So now I've just taken a back step. I'm going to work on my designs a little better to try not to cause conflict. I'm going to go more music themed and stuff like that. And uh, basically make sure that this works for what I'm trying to do. Um, and then personally, I've challenged myself. Uh, I mean, it's kind of an, <laughs> I, I don't know if Mason would agree, but basically I told him I'm coming for him. <laughs> he, uh, I said, you know, I, I've told him, I see him as a peer uh, and I can see that he can paint oil paintings, master paintings. Mm -hmm. He's a forger just like me. Um, so it's about time I push myself, I think. And so I pushed and challenged, I made it open. So uh, I'm going to do a couple Rembrandts, if not a bunch of Rembrandts. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to do them as best I can. Uh, the reason why I picked Rembrandt is I like the idea that he painted himself in his paintings. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, but, you know, I just find it really striking, especially the Sea of Galilee, knowing that it was stolen, it's still missing. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that the painting is gone and I can paint it again. And what's even funnier is I've actually got the beard for his paintings now, so. <laughs> is, is that the purpose uh, you of know, growing the beard or is that just a coincidence? It is a coincidence, I think, you know, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it is striking. It, when, you know, one thing I, I really notice about the Sea of Galilee is that Rembrandt really takes charge in that painting. Yeah. It's more about him mm -hmm. than anything else. And no matter what anyone else wants to say, it's my artist's opinion that it, he's painted himself as a, a creator, not the creator. He's putting himself on equal level, like balanced with the creator. In other words, that he's in control of his light that he dictates how much dark and light is in his work, in his creation. And so, you know, when you look at, at Rembrandt sitting on that boat, he's looking at us in full control. He doesn't seem too concerned about the sea at all. He has faith in his boat, yeah. right? Whereas the rest of the people in the boat seem like they are in fear that the boat's going to go down. And Jesus is actually gazing towards Rembrandt. It's, it's striking. I and mean, once you see it, it's like, okay, you can't unsee it. <laughs> you know, Rembrandt actually, I, I honestly believe that the church doesn't like that painting, never did, wanted it gone, and now it's gone. So I'm going to paint it again. But I'm going to paint me in Rembrandt's in position, you know. And so, you know, this is going to be a challenge. I've never done self-portraits. Yeah. I'm interested in it and I want to do it. So, you know, way we go. Nathan's going to be painted in a Rembrandt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I look forward to seeing it and I, I look forward to um, hearing more about the, um, the studio and, um, and seeing how you get on with that and the t shirt designs. And awesome. It's been great. I will keep to you informed. It's been great talking to you. Thank you for the opportunity. Amazing. No, no worries. Amazing. No worries. I, I, I'm really You're enjoying You're a great guy. I'm really enjoying talking to people all around the world. So it's a, the joy of technology these days is that, that I'm able to and um, able to give artists a platform where they can talk about what they, what they do and, and let people yeah. discover them through that. Totally. Way, through that way. Thank you. I mean, it, it is amazing that, you know, I'm here in Canada in the middle of the bush and you're all the way over in UK and we're able to sit and have this great conversation. I, it's a blessing and I really appreciate it. Thank you. No, no worries. No worries. Thanks for giving up a bit of your time today. It's much appreciated. Absolutely. Anytime.
And if you like what you've heard and seen today, um, why not hit the subscribe button below and um, subscribe to my channel. Uh, I will be um, interviewing many more artists over the coming months. So if you hit subscribe, you'll be the first to know about um, who I'm interviewing. And thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.